tonight we're going to have a look at multifaceted businesses and I think especially in the modern age quite often one revenue stream isn't enough to um, keep a business going or in the case of a founder that just has lots of interests there's the serendipity of mixing different revenue lines and creating something quite unique out of it or sometimes there's just a need for um for various other reasons to um to do things like um create foot traffic with one line of business uh, perhaps uh, create international sales with another or whatever so tonight the multifaceted business and we've got three really interesting but different businesses. So with us tonight, we have Chris Ammerman. Chris is the co-founder and commercial director of Caravan. Caravan's a legendary name uh, in, in London. We have Claire Patak, she's the owner of Violet Cakes. And if you don't know Claire, I think the thing that they're gonna say about you for the rest of your life is you did the Royal Wedding Cake. And, um, and, and next to me here is our Charlie Gladstone. Um, if you've been to Peddlers in Notting Hill, it's a bit of a legendary cafe. I want to kick off tonight, I think, and just go through with each of you, um, starting with you, Chris, what the genesis of the business was. Was coffee in your DNA to start with at Caravan? Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to do food all day. We wanted to serve breakfast, lunch and dinner, um, not close. And we wanted to roast our own coffee. And um, because we felt that, you know, we got here in 2001, we felt coffee was really the neg ne neglected product of, of, you know, all good restaurants. So you'd get a great meal, you'd get great service, and then you'd have a rubbish coffee. So um, we identified early, at least from, from our perspective, we wanted to take control of coffee and start roasting ourselves. Um, I, I don't think we planned to build it in, into what it's become now, but certainly we wanted to open with, you know, coffee um, as, as a central part of our business. And with the original site at Exmouth Market, mm. what sort of proportion was coffee of your business at that site? Um, what, financial? Yeah, or yeah, sort of, yeah. Um, probably um, maybe close to 10%. Okay, so even back then, food, food and other drinks was... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Food's always been kind of 60% of our business, absolutely. Okay. Great. Claire, for you, I'm guessing cakes came first and then coffee. Tell us the story. Yes, cakes came first. I started with a market stall on Broadway Market, and so I was just doing the cakes. I was bake all day on Friday, sell all day Saturday, and then during the week I was a food stylist. Um, and then when I opened in 2010 uh, the bakery, I just did pour overs because it was still just me and one other, <laughs> one other person, which is crazy. Um, and that was like all we could handle. And then we realized that we, we really wanted to up our coffee offering. Uh, so yeah, so then we got a, a little machine and that's how it. Yeah. And when you say you wanted to up your coffee offering, was that a business sort of need to do that? Or was Def that sort definitely. of completing the experience that people wanted better coffee, but really you were in the cakes business? Well, I felt that pour overs were the right thing to have with the cakes that we were serving. So for me, the uh, the the genesis of it was that it was. Uh, I mean, I made that choice because I thought it tasted better. But um, people wanted lattes. So, <laughs> so, so you gave in to the latte. Well, yeah, because I also was on a very quiet street and I was trying to run a successful business, and so I realized that I needed to do that. Yeah, and I guess if there's money walking out the door, why not? If people want. Definitely. If people want it. <laughs> Charlie, for you, Peddlers started as a wonderful little sort of homewares and bits and pieces. I mean, it, you can probably describe it better, but it, you'll find it, it's almost like a cave of wonders in there. There's all sorts of things. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, we, we actually work with All Press in three of our businesses, a festival and then a small chain of um, stores and restaurants that we have in the northwest. But in, but in London and Notting Hill, we have a, um, a shop to which we're, we're tied to a 10-year lease and... Um, and that store started out as a kind of gift and, um, and vintage store. The footfall in that um, area simply doesn't match the rent. And, um, and things have become incredibly tough a few years ago. We have a store that has the ground floor of about two thirds the size of this room. And the rent is 50 grand and the rates are now about 24, 25 grand. And, um, and selling other people's goods at relatively low margin um, which is, of course, a critical thing. So we're selling things on the whole that we bought at wholesale. So the wholesaler is selling them to us at twice what they paid for them, and we're then marking it up by 2.3, 2.4 times. We just simply weren't able to begin to make the thing work. So we, we really had two options. One was try and sub-assign the lease, but Notting Hill is, is in many ways dying on its knees because 
it's only really the luxury retailers that are, that are buying space there now. Um, for all the reasons that we understand, it's become a little bit like Bond Street. And, and, and I, I really love it there, and, and I wanted to try and make it work. And it seemed to me the logical thing was to try and do a cafe. And because I had experience in food, um, I have, I have a, a, a reasonably large kind of food offering elsewhere. Um, I just figured that doing it was, um, was, was, was worth trying. And in fact, now, talking about the percentages that you were speaking about, we now do, in our cafe, about 50% of our weekly turnover is done in the cafe. So and does that work us. from a margin point of view, like you're making good money on the coffee as well, or yeah. does that lead to increased footfall no, but then sells more, more uh, other stock? That's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think that working with all press is, is, is really important for us for lots of reasons that I think we might come to later. But I think having a blue chip coffee company is really important because the, the struggle with a business like that is you've got to become really good at two things. One is running a cafe and one is running a, a, a gift shop. And, and, and you may think, oh, you know, running a gift shop or running a cafe isn't a big deal. But actually, they are two very different things. There is a, a, a sort of a real challenge there. And so I think we just had to have great coffee as a, as a sort of anchor. Something really interesting there about having to do two things really well. Chris, you guys almost have to do three things really well. You have to be a great food venue. You have to make great coffee. But then you also roast as well. Was roasting part of the plan always, or is that... So I, I guess even more what I mean, is it intrinsic to the business model, the roasting, or is it something you do for horrible term but retail theatre and to make it feel like a great location? Because you have quite a big wholesale business as well, don't we you? We do, yeah. Um, we are... Um, I think we roast about three and a half tonne a week now. So it's its own separate business. So um, commercially, we kind of have a... Uh, a caravan coffee roasters hat and we have a, a restaurant hat um, but you know they work they kind of complement each other um, and again the restaurants are kind of the biggest shop window for the roastery for the coffee um, we're just about to open a new coffee roastery in North London in Islington uh, in a couple of weeks so um, then that will have its own kind of um, front-facing cafe and but yeah it's, it's always been uh, I mean Again, I don't, I don't think we started with the ambition to, you know, be, be a big London coffee roaster, but it's kind of grown organically and um, from, you know, sort of steady foundations, I think. Was that partly serendipitous because you got that Granary Square site? Because it seems to me you guys took an enormous step up in taking that site. Did that sort of... How did that come about, I guess? And, and yeah, how did that change your business, that site? Yeah, I think what it did was it gave us the confidence to, you know, do more. Um, I think it was probably quite a foolish, you know, kind of naive decision at, uh, from the outset, but it worked and, you know, a bit of, a bit of luck and a bit of kind of, you know, elbow grease. But it, uh, commercially it gave us the ability to do more. So, you know, it, it made money from the beginning and, and then we could look at other opportunities. But it was four years before we opened our third site. So, you know, it did take us a long time to get on top of that. and Quite a know, while to digest it that. It did, yeah. yeah. Claire, for you... Expansion. What does expansion look like? I kind of, I uh, always was a bit uncomfortable with the idea of opening multiple um, bakeries because my experience has, has been quite often that they lose something um, and all the chain bakeries nobody really likes. So um, they may make a lot of money, although now they're closed. Some of them. Yeah. Are do they even they, make a lot of money? I think they I do, and then yeah. they don't. Right. It's, like, <laughs> it's that classic kind of like yeah, yeah. private equity buys in, rolls them out yes, to lots of locations. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I just couldn't live with that, so I decided to just have one and make it really great. Um, and then I have a, um, some of the things happening this year. Charlie, for you, I'm thinking about your location, and I I, I know that area quite well. There's every coffee chain imaginable just around you. How have you sort of differentiated across the territory there? Or have you just let that happen? Uh, that, that's interesting. I mean, I think that, there are, that we have... So if you don't know Portobello, there are, and there are all of the chains. I mean, the Starbucks and, and whatever else, Costa and all the rest of it. And then there are quite a few others. But there are only two people who are doing serious coffee. I think that the only way as an independent that we can distinguish ourselves in London is by having a very clear 
um, offering coffee. And actually, what I would say about all press, and, and um, I, I don't know what the sort of relevance particularly of this comment is to individuals here, but what they're really good at is, is looking after you and nurturing you and training you. For us, for me going into coffee, that felt like that was the most important thing because everyone who, who works on our team was being trained by them. What, what's allowed us to, to, to build a USP is that kind of really consistent quality. So it may take time, but I think that when people come to us, they, are beginning to re they begin to really know that, that what we do is good because our team have been well-trained. And of course, that's incredibly important for a team, I mean, let's not forget that, that you know, you're gonna get a sort of cursory relationship as an employer with your staff if you're just saying, oh, kind of go over there and do this and make the coffee. But if they're sent over to this amazing operation that these guys have um, and, and trained properly, then um, that's engaging for our staff as well as our customers. I think that's interesting that kind of like having a USP as a coffee business. And I think, Chris, you know, it's easy from the outside to look at coffee and go, well, look, it's all pretty much the same. Someone roasts a bit more in this style, that style. For you guys, as, and I'm thinking here as much wholesale probably as retail, how did you guys kind of refine your USP as a wholesaler and, and how hard is it to, to kind of promote and defend that as a, as a territory? As a USP, I think it's... Um, look, I, look, I think all press do that very well. Uh, some other companies do that really well. I think it's about quality of coffee. It's about training, uh, as Charlie said. Um, and it's about using good equipment. So those are the three pillars of our business. It's about good sourcing as well. So it's, it's not a magic wand. It really is just you know, working hard and, and getting those kind of pillars right in your business. And do you see a time when we reach kind of coffee saturation? You know, I think... I certainly, when I go back to the Australian market, I mean, every single shop, it doesn't matter what it is, is serving coffee uh, in, in the mall or, or in, a, in a shopping precinct. Yet they all still seem to have trade. Uh, I, I imagine here we're a little behind that still, but are you feeling any sort of sense of the extension into coffee for, um, for a lot of mixed retail is, is reaching saturation? Um, I don't think at the top end of the market. I think, you know, I think the chains are probably struggling a bit, but I think at the top end on the specialty independent side, I think it's... Um, you know, I, th I think there's room for growth. You know, it's a product where you can taste the difference. So I think, um, you know, better coffee um, on, you know, on the high street or, or everywhere is, is good for everyone, really. I guess that that's a similar story for you, Claire, and sort of started with pour over, but then actually, you know, demand sort of drove you up the tree. We started with Jack Coleman because he helped me get started and he was, he was amazing. I needed a better machine <laughs> um, and so, I couldn't afford it, and I met the All Press guys, and they were like, well, we can help you with that, and you can pay it off over time, and I was like, uh, I have this relationship with somebody already, I don't know what to do, and then they really wooed me because they're amazing, and, um, and, I w and I just thought it was the right decision, so um, I switched, and um, we're s I'm still friends with Jack, which is nice. <laughs> so it all ended up happily. <laughs> But yeah, but I think that yeah, it was a big deal to get a better machine and to um, yeah to think about what was most important for my business, not just for like your relationships, but your relationships are so important too. And I'm just thinking about you know how you got, you guys are working together with with all press and everyone. We all kind of work together, and I think that yeah, that's it's quite a cohesive ecosystem, isn't it? Yeah, and I think also on my street, there's three places that serve coffee. Um, and people choose, some people choose to go to the one they think is the best and some people go to the one that's literally outside their door because they're too lazy. Yeah, they're too lazy to so I think you're going to have always, traverse. yeah. I think what's interesting as well is you're in the epicenter of kind of leading edge coffee probably. Charlie, you were telling me before there's a real difference between your London property where having a blue chip coffee brand has brought traffic in versus your properties that are outside of London, although not under the um, Peddler's brand, where perhaps it's the other way around? Tell us a little bit about the role coffee plays outside of London. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting. I, I think that, you know, London is its own world, as, as, as we all know, and I mean, most major cities are, but certainly in, we're in the northwest, sort of Manchester, Liverpool, kind of Chester area with our other businesses. And the truth is that, that um, you know, it is... The market there is several years behind. Um, so we still have to serve um, through demand or to meet demand the, uh, cappuccino in enormous mugs, which, which I, th I think look absolutely revolting. But, but people want to have that. Um, and, but, but then I was quite surprised recently that actually in the last 
eight months or so, flat white has become our biggest drink. So, you know, flat white was not something that most people had heard of outside of sort of, well, Spitalfields or, or Dalston or somewhere. A, a, you know, a couple, literally, I mean, what, three years ago or something? And so things do spread very quickly. Um, I, I think in terms of kind of um, the regions, another thing is that, that it tends to be, we tend to be more price sensitive in the, uh, in the Northwest. I want to talk a little bit about building a following, and Chris, I'm going to hit you up for this first of all. Today, obviously, it's fine to have a great premise and great word of mouth and reviews when you open. How did you guys build a bigger following around uh, Caravan? Yeah, I think we grew it organically in the beginning. I think we, uh, we looked uh, internally into the business to, to kind of um, work on, uh, you know, work on the product, um, albeit, you know, whether it's food or service or, you know, music or how the, you know, restaurants look. Um, uh, I think that's all really important. And then um, we then started to look outside at social media. Social media is obviously an, uh, a really important thing. But I, I think it's, we've always found it a little bit embarrassing. Maybe that's a Kiwi thing to kind of talk about ourselves and, and you know, promote ourselves. So um, we've always tried to do it in a very kind of um, associated way. So, you know, just try and do something really great and hope people kind of... Um, uh, you know, also think it's good. And get on board. Yeah. Claire, for you, obviously we're talking a lot about coffee to you tonight, but really cakes is what you're famous for and yeah. you have a, a lot of other things that I guess get you guys' attention, your food styling, um, uh, the cake business, etc. Do you find you you rely on that to drive traffic or did you have to in the early days use kind of brand Claire to drive all that or was it pr very much product first? I realised that that helped a lot. So... Um, I really like social media. I've, I've used Instagram um, since it started, and I, I just really liked doing it. And because I'm a food stylist, taking photographs of the cakes that we were making was something that I was doing anyway. Um, but we would find people would come in and say, "I just saw this cake, and I came in to get it." You know, so it re like really works for us. Um, but then also because I do, I write cookbooks, and every. I think you write lots of cookbooks. You guys write cookbooks. Well, yeah, not me yeah. so much. But, <laughs> yeah. but that yeah, helps to sell. So for people that, um, so for followers that are in other countries, um, that sells books and had to have that. And then um, it really it has driven with the royal wedding, something like that, which. Um, that must have been enormous for you, was it? It's crazy, like crazy and amazing. Um, and we just like head down trying to keep everything, you know, the quality really high and the service really good still. But, you know, we went from having like 60,000 followers to having 210,000 followers in a weekend. <laughs> Boom. If your social media is good and you like doing it, then it can re be really great for your business. Charlie, are you Snapchatting 24-7 to drive the crowds? No, but actually, them? my view here is that I think the, the thing that I'm most interested in, and I think that the thing that is often overlooked here, is that you can, you can run all these businesses, and, and you two are both brilliant at it. But it, you've got to have... It's all about people. And if you can employ people who are happy, to whom you are kind and to whom you are decent, and who are equally decent and kind to your customers, then all of this other stuff becomes almost superfluous, I think. We mustn't overlook that. You know, we can talk about Instagram and, and the right coffee and, and, and the right this and the right that and the right location. But, but I mean, you can make a world of difference through that. I want to I wanna jump to questions in a minute because I, I think we've probably got some really good questions for the panel. But because we're kind of doing this sort of different business lines thing, I just want to run through all three of you. Just get a bit of a percentage breakdown of sort of how the different lines in your business contribute to revenue. I think, um, Chris, for you, if we sort of go roasting, food, coffee, what's the sort of percentage split across your revenue? Um, well, they're, they're different businesses. So roasting is its own business. Um, so, so you don't view it as a... Yeah, as no. A so, well, no, it, it sits outside the, the kind of the restaurant um, group. But um, we're, we're a classic 60-40, 60% food, 40% beverage. Right. Um, probably in some of our sites, the city, it's 50-50. Um, and then is the wholesale business more. bigger than that entire business? Uh, no, no, no. Um, so uh, King's Cross is, is the biggest right. business, uh, turnover-wise. Yeah, you can never get a table in there. It's always packed. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then probably uh, probably coffee is actually the second. Okay, interesting. I guess. 
Yeah. Claire, for you, cakes versus coffee? So uh, we're like 60, 40, sort of in a different way. So we're like 40% cakes and orders. Really? And then we're like 30 um, uh, coffee and 30 savory. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize you did savory as well. We do a little bit of savory, yeah. That's the mix. And Charlie, for you? These days, in something like Peddlers, what is coffee? Well, I mean, I, in, in Peddlers, I, I couldn't, to be honest with you, I couldn't give you the figure for coffee, but the cafe constitutes about half of the turnover. But interesting okay. enough, in the in, in um, the northwest, we have a big um, food shop, and um, six or seven years ago, the cafe constituted about twenty percent of the turnover there, and now it constitutes just over fifty-five percent. Great questions. Anyone got any questions out there for us? Boom. on the whole very well um, uh, because I think that if I, I, it, it is a different skill but generally people who are engaged I think are quite keen to learn new things I think that if you can if you can engage people and, and treat them well and, and I don't think this necessarily means you have to pay them any more than elsewhere but if they feel engaged then I think they're quite often quite happy to um, to evolve and, and I'm also a great one for, uh, I, I'm, I'm almost often too honest, but I mean, I think I'd, I like to say to my guys, look, you know, this is a, this is a disaster here. You know, you, this is our rent, this is our rate, this is what you cost, this is what this costs. You know, you can see we're not making money. So what are we going to do, you know, to do it? And then, and then almost try and engage them to go on that, um, down that path. So on the whole, I think, I think, most people probably want a bit of evolution in their job. So I've always um, just self-funded um, because I started with a market stall, which was basically free, <laughs> um, and saved and built my business up that way, um, which I was always really proud of. But then I got to a point where I realized that I, I, if I wanted to grow, I needed to, to get some help. So uh, yeah, that's really scary. It feels like I'm doing the right thing, <laughs> but I'm petrified. And I wake up at 4 in the morning every day. You know what? Every restaurant is, um, is a leap of faith. Um, and it's always scary, I think, because they cost so much money. And then, uh, you know, so much work and then you open and you kind of wait for people to come through the door. And it's, it, it, you know, it is, it is traumatic. And then, then you've got all the, you know, is the food right? Is the service right? And all that to work on. I think um, uh, the, the single most scary was for us King's Cross because it was in a, you know, a wasteland of, you know, where it was formerly the Cross and Bagley's and Red Light District. And everyone that we trusted told us not to do it. But we just kind of fell in love with the site, and um, so it was a, an emotional decision for us. So luckily, it paid off. But it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a hugely calculated move by us. It really was um, a leap of faith. Can I can I tell you what what I where I really s screwed up? I overexpanded with peddlers, and um, it was quite a successful online business. And we opened eight shops in the UK, or nine in fact, and one in Japan in the space of about. Mm -hmm. Um, two years. Including and a concession in Selfridges. Yeah, well, that's right. And it was a disaster. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hit a major cash flow hole. It's so easy to think that four is better than two and eight is better than six. That is, that's a tight spot and it's a classic story for small and large businesses. But I, I, I really put hits. on an incredibly brave face to every single person except for my wife for about six or eight months and basically worked my backside off to try and negotiate out of deals and um, pay off um, people on payment plans and get out of leases and um, oh, so you just sort of scale I, we kind of we backed out yeah and, and actually I, I borrowed some more money which probably wasn't very sensible but I was kind of de determined and quite proud but but um, you know it wasn't pleasant I mean it was like doing a really really meaty MBA so <laughs> I did I did a very it could have been potentially quite expensive <laughs> But I did learn an awful lot, and, and I think I, and it hasn't stopped me from... I mean, since then, I've launched a festival and, um, and a couple of other businesses, but it hasn't stopped me, but it's, it really taught me. And, and, and I, do, you know, I, I, I mentor quite a lot of people who are doing kind of, you know, I've got one restaurant or, again, a, you know, two shops and wants to do ten or whatever, and, and I think it, it's, it's staggering how quickly you can get yourself into that hole. Probably everyone knows that. I'm just, I was just naive.
I just wanted to add one thing. You, you mentor people, and I think getting a mentor is like a really great idea. I have two. I use them all the time, and it's so helpful. Um, and they want you to do well, and there's no money exchange, so it's mm. great. People don't realise it's sometimes a really lonely thing being a, a founder or running a business yeah. and actually having that sort of support network. Yeah. We're, we're three founders. Um, Laura is my partner and Miles, um, it, we're all old friends. We used to work together in New Zealand in the 1990s. So for us, we still work in the business every day. Um, so I think that's the reason why, um, you know, every site we do, we want it to be unique. Um, we, we probably care too much what people think about us. So if we uh, turned in, you know, if we opened a, a, a site, site by site and in a cookie cutter approach, we would think everyone thinks we're a chain because we would be. So we open sites that are all unique um, with new menus and things like that. And it, also because we're, we're kind of passionate about what we do. Um, we like to be creative, innovative. You know, we're always trying to, um, you know, work on new menus, new drinks lists and, and things like that. We're, we're kind of opening a, an internal bakery in the, um, in the coffee roastery that we're launching. Um, it won't be anything like... Claire's fantastic. Um, no raw cakes. But um, so, you know, that, that's the reason why it's, I guess, we, it, w it wouldn't be any fun if we, if we did it. Yeah, I mean, we, we rationalise in terms of, you know, the operation, in terms of, you know, sometimes suppliers and things like that. You get, you get commercial benefits from leveraging certain things. But I, I think creatively, um, no, it's not tempting, no. It's because, you know, we love what we do and, and it, we, get, we go to work every day seeing what we do and um, if, if we, you know, if you fell out of love with that, it would be um, just a job, I guess. I work by myself and so um, part of my decisions about how to grow my business are, you know, relate to that. Um, and... I have to love going to work every day, otherwise it won't work. And for me, I, I also have a two and a half year old child, and so it's really hard to like do everything and you know, m you know, just make every single thing work. So you have to find a way to make it work. And I'm very, I still also really want my business to be successful, um, and I want to grow. And I'm also hugely passionate, so I'm never satisfied with you know, kind of just uh, doing what we've always done or doing the same thing again and again in a cookie cutter fashion. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make me excited. So I've had to develop my business in a way that will keep me excited. So with the bakery, I also write the cookbooks. Um, I do the styling, then I'm starting this other business, which I can't talk about, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a separate business, also a food business, um, and just sort of slightly moving sideways instead of um, opening more shops because for me that's just my heart wouldn't be in it. I, I think what's really interesting in that just to sort of wrap up and if there's any sort of truism we see as a magazine talking to all sorts of different sizes and shapes of businesses is there is no one size fits all and there is a there's kind of a media narrative that goes here's 10 steps to success or here's how I built my business with the inference that you too can become a millionaire if you do what I did but the reality is even just up here tonight and actually if you include us as well there's four completely differently shaped and sized businesses some with complete contradictions one outlet being successful multiple outlets being successful all sorts of different formats and thrills and spills and bits and although coffee unifies the three deployed in really different fashions and I think whenever people ask for you know oh, what's the what's the advice you can give us courier actually the biggest one is don't believe us don't believe anyone just talk to a whole lot of people see a whole lot of different case studies and then figure out what fits for you and what I think you can be kind of authentic in and the one commonality between all these businesses is quite the the, the authenticity and the sort of the product centricity I think of what everyone's doing with that in mind, a couple of thank yous. Big thank you to our panel tonight. Massive thank you to All Press, uh, who, um, who sponsor these events and um, feed us amazingly. I think we have pizza tonight to feed the hordes. All right. Uh, to Rafa, of course, um, for the premises. And to you guys for coming. Thank you very much. Maverick has the stand, as usual, if you need a back copy over there. Uh, also sign up to our weekly email. 
if um, any of you don't get it, we've got a little postcard there with the details on it. Thanks, and, uh, and see you again. Thank you.